Now let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Now we're going to look really closely at just how bad we are. Start with verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged what? Both Jews and Greeks. How much of humanity does that cover? All of it. There's nobody left out. There's Jews and Greeks, that's all of it. Okay? So he says that we have charged them all under what? They're all under sin, as it is written. And he starts to give you quotes from the Old Testament. There is none righteous. Is there one? No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and they have all together become what? That doesn't sound like good news, does it? But brothers and sisters, that's us in our fallen state. And this is why God is able to look at us and say, there is nothing that you can ever do to bring you in a right standing with me. So what I have done is I have given you my son, and he has placed you in a right standing with me. That is the gospel. Amen. That in Christ, how many of you guys pack your lunch for work? Anybody? What do you put your sandwich in? <coughs> you ever use those Ziploc bags? Yeah. Right. Okay. Think about that. You take that sandwich, you put it in that bag. That's the same thing that we are in Christ. Christ has swallowed us up. And he has taken all of this stuff that's unprofitable. There's none that's good, no, not one. And he has taken that. And he's taken that on himself. And so now what you have is what we inherited from Adam after the fall. All that bad stuff. In Christ, Christ in the Bible is called the new Adam, the second Adam. In Christ, you have been born again. And so, all of his righteousness, was Christ righteous? No. Was there any sin in him at all? No. Was there any <laughs> defect in him at all? No. So, in Christ, you have everything. You have everything that he was born with, that he died with, and he was raised with. That last part, that he was raised with. Is that good news? Amen. Think about this. Think about this. You put your sandwich in that bag. This is what Paul talks about when we are in Christ. And you need to put yourself in Christ every day. Now listen, this is our problem. We put ourselves in Christ and we keep taking ourselves out. And we put ourselves in Christ and take ourselves out. It's not the way this is supposed to work. Okay? This is why it is a continual act of submission. That I submit to God in Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in me, lives in me, works in me. And now I have become a mirror that just reflects God's goodness, God's righteousness, God's perfection. How many of you guys are perfect? Raise your hand. In Christ. See, everybody in here that knows Christ should raise your hand. In Christ. Because in Christ, it all depends on how you ask the question, right? We live in this flesh, and we understand how powerful and how strong it can be, but is your flesh more powerful than Jesus Christ? No. Can your flesh conquer death? No. Did Christ conquer death? Yes. So he who is in you is what? Greater, Greater than he who is in you. Okay, so let me share some of this with you. Again, I want you to think about when the Jews heard what Paul was preaching question had to come to their mind. 
Well, if that's the case, then what profit is there in circumcision? Why did God give it to Abraham? Was there any profit in the circumcision that he gave to Abraham? No. And the answer to that is? No. Yes, son. Depending on how you look at the question. The answer is yes. Why would God give something that had no profit in it? You have to understand what it was. Circumcision was not the end of it all. Circumcision was just a sign of what God was trying to do in the heart. Okay? And so God gave him circumcision. But he was already accounted righteous because of his faith. And so the circumcision was given as a sign of that faith, right? Because we as humans do better when we have something tangible, something we can see. Now, that same line of thought and teaching also goes hand in hand with the Sabbath, right? Are you saved by Sabbath keeping? No. Is there any prophet outside of Christ in Sabbath keeping? No. No? So, but why do we do it? Because the Sabbath is a sign of God's power to create and recreate. So we keep the Sabbath because we rest in Christ, because our salvation and everything that we need comes from Him. And we can do absolutely nothing except accept and say, thank you. See, they're listening. Yes, thank you. All right, so, just what was the prophet of circumcision? We are not told in this chapter. The statement of the fact was enough for this place. For the only point in the mind of the writer was to show what circumcision is and who are the really circumcised. A great deal depends on these few verses. Now listen, because this is important. This book was written back in 1895 and 1896 as a series that was in Signs of the Times. And they put them all together in this one book. And I would recommend that you can get this. Where, Ricky? From Amazon? Yeah. This is Wagner on Romans. Very good book. A great deal depends on these few verses. They should be studied carefully because upon them depends the proper understanding of a large portion of the prophecies in the Old Testament. And this is what I want you to think about. Because he's going to make a statement here that is a theological point that is preached in most Protestant churches today. And if they would have done their due diligence and study, this mistake would have never happened. Okay? Look. See how God has worked in the dealings of men. So again, a great deal depends on these few verses. They should be studied carefully because upon them depends on the proper understanding of a large portion of the prophecy in the Old Testament. If these verses had received the consideration that they ought to have by professed Bible students, the unprofitable and misleading suppositions about the return of the Jews to Jerusalem before the coming of the Lord would never have been made. That was written in 1895. Now, any of you, if you know anything about dispensationalism, about futurism, and about the theology that's taught in most Protestant churches today. One of the things that they looked at was the Jews coming back to the Holy Land. That was a direct fulfillment to them of what Christ said in these prophecies. The same teaching that Paul tried to get across to his readers, we need to know today. The true Jew, the true follower of Christ, the true child of God, is not one outwardly. It doesn't come from heritage. It doesn't matter who your father or your grandfather or your great-grandfather was, or what your lineage is or your pedigree. It comes from Jesus Christ. And it comes from circumcision of the heart, Amen. not of the flesh. We need to know this and understand this today, because this is a deception that has gone worldwide. Most people you talk to, they're still looking and focused on the actual city of Jerusalem and the nation thereof. God has given us time prophecies, and God has raised the church to give clarity in those time prophecies. But even that church 
has become diluted. That may not have been the right word. <laughs> diluted in if you put like a lot of water in a sugary drink, what does it do? Um, Dilutes. Did I use the right word? Yes. Okay. Just make sure y'all know. The Seventh day Adventist church today has kind of lost its way in what it was raised for and why we're here and what we're supposed to be preaching and what we're supposed to be doing. We are called for one purpose, and that purpose is to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And how do you prepare a people for that if you've forgotten what you're actually supposed to teach? Mm. Think about that one. Okay, so reading on. Circumcision through Christ. You are complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's Colossians 2, verses 8 through 11. Circumcision must have meant as much when first given as it ever did. Therefore, from the very beginning, it meant righteousness through Christ alone. Again, if due diligence was put forth in Bible study, we wouldn't have all this confusion today. Dispensationalists teach that there have been different ages and God has had different ways to save people. That in Moses' day, they were saved by the law. But Christ came, and now you're saved by grace. And then when Jesus comes again, you're going to be saved by the law again because from one new moon and from one Sabbath to another, you're going to meet with Him. Does that make any sense? No. God has had one way to save. And that one way is the one name given to all men whereby we can be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know why it can only be Jesus Christ? Do you know why I'm not narrow-minded by saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through Him? Because no man can come to the Father except through Him. Why? Because you cannot pay for your own sin. Amen. And your Father can't pay for your sin. And you can't give enough offering to pay for your sin. Only Christ's blood can pay for your sin. Amen? Amen. 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 This is why God said there is one way, only one, and you have to approach me in that way. Because it's either righteousness by faith or it's righteousness by works. And God does not want the latter. He wants the first one. I said, oh God, I said, no, no. So let me continue to read this. circumcised says that he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised. To the question, what is circumcision? The answer must therefore be the sign of circumcision is a seal of righteousness by faith. So when is circumcision made uncircumcision? This being the case, it is evident that where there is no righteousness, the sign of circumcision is worthless. So the apostle says, If thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. As in the previous verses, we learned that the form without the fact amounts to nothing. Did you get that? The form without the fact amounts to nothing. That, brothers and sisters, is hypocrisy. Right? Is that what hypocrisy is? Now listen, so this is what Paul is talking about in his day. And it is the same that we need to know in our day. Because there are so many professed followers of Christ who are living a life of hypocrisy. On the outside, you look great. But on the inside, dead men's bones. <laughs> the 
Sign without the substance is of no account. It is very easy for a poor man to put out a sign advertising boots and shoes, but to fill the shop with goods requires capital. So if he has a sign but no boots and shoes, he is worse off than if he had no sign at all. So this next one is the mistake of the Jews. The Jews made a mistake of supposing that the sign, the sign, they supposed that the sign itself was sufficient for their salvation. They finally came to hold the idea that the sign would bring the reality, just as many professed Christians in these days suppose that the performance of certain rites will make them members of the body of Christ. But circumcision of the flesh alone could represent no righteousness. It only represents sin. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We looked at this last week. We'll look at it again. Here's a list, another list. Paul's going to be list. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Here's another uncomfortable list. Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. Actually, let's start with verse um, 16. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of what? <laughs> verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Another word that can be used there is war. The flesh wars against the Spirit, the Spirit wars against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19, for the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Man, it doesn't end it there. It just keeps going on. Verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in past times. Now, these sets of verses, is he writing them to the heathen, or is he writing them to the Christian? And he's telling them, listen, make sure you understand this, that if you live this life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is the problem with Protestantism today. Oh, only one amen? <laughs> Seriously, if you look at the condition of the churches, can you not see this for yourself? Yes. That has crept into the Adventist church. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What God required from Adam before the fall, God still requires from me and you after the fall. Amen. The only thing is, we can't perform what He requires. But God in His love, and God in His grace, and God in His mercy, has given me the opportunity and the power to be reborn again in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so in Christ, what God requires, God now gives me the power to accomplish. Amen. Right? Not that I can do it, but it's Christ who lives in me. Because Paul says, I can do eh, certain things. I can do all things through Christ. Amen. So we read Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. It says, As a matter of fact, many of those whom they despised as uncircumcised were thus in reality circumcised, while they themselves were not. What they're saying right there is that the Jews would look down on sinners. And I'll give you one example. Let's take Mary. Mary Magdalene. Okay? Simon invited Jesus to his house for lunch. Right? Mary came to the house, and she had one thought in her mind. And the fear of all these men did not stop her from washing the feet of her Lord and Savior with her tears. Now, when she came in there, what were those men thinking? Those good, upstanding Jewish leaders. When they looked at her, were they thinking, what a beautiful woman. 
Look what she's doing. What were their thoughts? If he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch her. Right? What was Jesus' thought towards Mary? Love. Love. Did he see her sin? Yes. Did he allow that to impair his judgment for who she was as a daughter of God? No. Listen. He knew her sin. And he saved her from her sin. Now listen. Did she get better all at one time? Like the first time she met Jesus, Jesus said, you are clean and boom, she had no other problems after that? No. says that Jesus cast out how many demons from her? Mm. Think about that. Did you ever think why the Jewish leaders who had all this outward righteousness, people looked at them and said, they, they are the bar. And if we can get somewhere close to that, then we'll be pretty good. And Jesus said, you've got to exceed their righteousness. Okay? Because everything they have is just a show. It's on the outside. What God cares about is on the inside. Did you ever wonder why Mary was so attracted to Jesus? Why the sinners, the tax collectors, the wicked, who the Jewish leaders wanted nothing to do with, why were they attracted to Christ and wanted nothing to do with the Jewish leaders? What was it about him that attracted the sinner? He did Say that loud. He did not what? He did not condemn them. He did not condemn them. Did he just overlook their sin? No. What he did is he saw them in their proper place. He saw them as a child of the living God who were bound in slavery to Satan. And he wanted to give them freedom by allowing them now to be bound in slavery to him. That's a paradox, isn't it? Amen. Come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He saw all of the children of Adam as they were bound down by sin and they were harassed by the devil. And he came with power to break that spell. And he came with power to restore them. And he came with power to allow them to see the beauty that's in other people. Pharisees had no beauty. They had condemnation. They had judgment. And they had death. What Christ comes to give you is a new heart. It's actually a new mind. A mind. And that if you deal with depression, if you deal with mental issues, that does not have to be more powerful than the Christ that lives inside of you. Right. Doesn't mean that they go away. You deal with those issues, but Christ can give you the power to overcome them. Give you the power and the hope that when you're in the depths of depression, that you can look up. That's my advice to you. Look up. The devil wants you to look down. Christ says, look up. Look up. Know him. Realize that he is always with you, even in the depths of that darkness. So let me read just a couple more things, and then we'll be done for this morning. Real circumcision is a matter of the heart, that is, of the inner life and not at all of the flesh. The apostle plainly declares that what is outward in the flesh is not circumcision, that is, which consists only in outward form. But circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. This is stated as a general truth. That was not a new departure in the days of Paul, but was the case from the beginning. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, we read the words of Moses to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise, what? Thine heart and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. All true Jews recognize that true circumcision was only of the heart. For Stephen addressed those who rejected the truth as in Acts 7, verse 51, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. The psalmist says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. That's Psalms chapter 2, verse 6. Mere outward righteousness is nothing. It's hypocrisy. It is with the heart that man believes unto righteousness, Romans 10, 10. When Moses, at the command of the Lord, rehearsed the law to Israel, he said, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. There can be no righteousness that is not the real life. Therefore, since circumcision is but a sign of righteousness, it is evident that there can be no real circumcision except circumcision of the heart. For we know that the law is spiritual, Romans 7, 14, that is, it is the nature of the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? The law is spiritual. The law is the nature of the Holy Spirit, for the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit of God that can put the law of God into the heart of man. Therefore, true circumcision is the work of the Holy Spirit. Stephen called the wicked Jews uncircumcised because he said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. If we remember that circumcision was given as the seal of righteousness by faith and that the inheritance promised to Abraham and his seed was through the righteousness of the law, Romans 4, 11 through 13, we shall see that circumcision was the pledge of that inheritance. Do you understand what he just said there? I had to have it explained to me earlier. Okay? Let me read it again. You have no problem with this first point. If we remember that circumcision was the seal of righteousness by faith, you get that part, right? Circumcision is the seal of righteousness by faith. That the inheritance promised to Abraham. What's the inheritance that God promised to Abraham? That through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That through Abraham, if you are his seed, then you are Christ and heirs according to the promise. So what do we inherit from Abraham? Righteousness by faith, our relationship with God, sanctification, glorification, and the ability to reflect the character of God. Amen. 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 And that's why he says in this last part, that the inheritance promised to Abraham and his seed was through the righteousness of the law. What is the righteousness of the law? It's God's character. It is who he is and what we're not. Does the law ever save us? Why were we given the law? The law was given to us to show us who and what we really are, right? The law is holy and just and right and it is good and it is perfect and I look at that and I see myself outside of Christ as unholy unrighteous and imperfect and so what the law does is it brings me to Christ because only in Christ can I obtain righteousness and holiness and justice Amen, Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 625.